Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining our webinar today. I wanted to welcome you. My name is Richard Capone. I'll be the moderator. Uh, first of all, let me go over a few logistical issues. On the right in this program, in this uh, webinar program, you will see a nav bar. On that nav bar, you'll be able to control your audio. You'll be able to control um, some other apps. I want to say thank you again to Richard uh, for his support in our district and really being focused on our students first um, and really helping us serve our kids. And then also for Phyllis providing a, a platform through CASE to really highlight um, these exceptional things that we can do uh, as a network. So I'm excited to share our story with you. Um, I'm going to start us off and then I'm going to hand it over to the, the real miracle workers in our in our system, which is Ms. Botcher and Ms. Fesco. So I just uh, want to share a little bit about our district. Uh, so we're, we're a, a district, Florence Unified School District, uh, just outside the Phoenix metro area. So we're kind of an ex-urban, in between rural and suburban district. Uh, we're a pretty large system for uh, most school districts in Arizona um, that are not kind of in the metro region. Uh, we have about 10,000 total students, um, but about 1,800, a little over, uh, students uh, on IEPs. And that includes quite a significant amount of preschool students as well. Uh, we have about 1,500 students in our K through 12 system. Um, large geographic footprint um, covers 900 square miles in 13 schools. So we do a, quite a bit of transporting. Um, there are parts of our community that struggle with um, access uh, through internet or social services and a lot of other support systems. So we work to provide a lot of those supports to our students as well. Um, I put in here our special education graduation rate just to give people an idea of um, kind of what we're focused on as far as um, metrics. And we really uh, have done a lot to improve that recently. Um, and 85% for, for our students with disabilities, still a slight gap between them and their non-disabled peers. Um, but we're really uh, proud of, of really getting our students to, to graduate and be successful post, uh, post high school. Um, and then just to give you an idea of what we're, we're kind of talking about today, I, I put two data points down there that really drove um, a lot of our decision making around looking at Let's Go Learn. Uh, and that's our, our ELA and our math data. And I call it equity data because it's really about making sure our, we're serving all students uh, in our system. And when we're focused on students with disabilities, we know that there tends to be a significant gap in performance. And so you can see there, there's a pretty significant uh, chunk of, of um, discrepancy between proficiency in our students with disabilities in these core content areas and their peers. And so that's what, what spurred us to look at additional supports uh, and solutions to, to support our kids. So what I want to do today is kind of give you a, a little bit of a, a idea of how we approached this um, and uh, implemented uh, Let's Go Learn as our solution and, and some of the results that we're getting in our ongoing, uh, our ongoing problem solving. So this is a, kind of the framework that we uh, have identified um, when we approach uh, looking at different types of uh, barriers to learning for students. Uh, and we, we frame it in these four different kind of phases. And so it's really an action research. If you guys are familiar with action research, we kind of like to use that framework um, as we go and approach these different issues. And so we start off with a problem of practice, identifying um, what the real issue is that we need to tackle. Um, and then from there, we, we need to develop a theory of action. What is it that is going to lead? What actions are going to lead to the results that we want? Um, that then translates into our design and implementation phase where we're doing the work of, of implementing uh, whatever solution we've identified as um, our approach. Uh, and then really being intentional about the reflection and revision process. And so it's ongoing. This is a circle. and We always are, are continually identifying the next problem of practice so we can achieve the results that we want. So this is this process, we're in always uh, going through these phases um, as we're trying to support our students. So just to, to further identify what our problem of practice was that we um, thought that we needed to identify to get traction. And it's really about providing our students with disabilities that really focused, sustained, individualized, high quality and evidence-based instruction. Um, we know that uh, our students across the board need different supports, whether they have disabilities or not. But with our students who have um, learning disabilities, uh, communication uh, disabilities, whatever it may be, we really need to be hyper-focused on what we know works and providing that in, in a real intentional and strategic way to make sure that they learn at a rate 
that is really above and beyond what their typical peers are learning so that we reduce the gap between performance. And that's what it's focused on. Um, and we know uh, there's a lot of other skills that we wanna support kids. This particular uh, project is really focused on their literacy and numeracy skills. So here is our theory of action that we have identified as um, our focus. And we frame it as in these if then statements. Um, so if we provide students with access to rigorous instruction and we provide diagnostic tools to identify students' learning gaps and we train staff to support individual learning pathways, then our students in special education will see an increased rate of their learning and reduce the achievement gap between them and their peers on measures of literacy and numeracy skills. So we need to follow this pathway if we're going to gain traction and reduce that gap um, and making sure that we're holding to each of those components. Uh, so when we when we talk about our barriers, when we talk about our next problem of practice, we want to follow through with this framework and really identifying what action steps are necessary for us to achieve the results that we need. And it's really that framework that helps us when we talk about problem solving, when we talk about um, strategic planning of, of addressing each of these, is being intentional about those steps. And one other thing I want to... Um, talk about is our MTSS framework. Uh, and this is really kind of how we highlight most of the work that we do in our district. Um, and it's through this lens of MTSS. Uh, and, and we've been really uh, focused on this as a district-wide initiative the last couple of years to ensure that we're providing multiple levels of support for every child in our system. And so when we're talking about Let's Go Learn as, as our focused uh, intervention, um, it's really framed within uh, this framework. Uh, and we, we want to make sure that we don't view specially designed instruction as tier three, that all kids may need intensive supports at one point or another in different areas, but that, the, that our focused skill-based intervention is embedded throughout uh, for our students with disabilities. So just kind of wanted to make sure that we always come back to this framework because I feel like this is really important for us as school systems to frame the different levels of support that kids need regardless of whether they have disabilities or not. So that's kind of a broad overview and I'm going to turn it over now to Ms. Botcher and she's going to walk us through kind of our design and implementation of Let's Go Learn and what that looked like for our specific district uh, to give you guys an idea of how we approached uh, this implementation process. Thank you, Adam. Um, so as Adam was saying, we really do try to look at everything we do through the lens of MTSS, having um, the ability to um, partner with LGL three years ago. What I didn't know then was how flexible of a tool it would be and that we can use um, LGL as something that is diagnostic in nature for our students with disabilities, but it can also be used anywhere in the MTSS structure. So that was something that um, was a bonus for us as we started to really dive deep and work in with Let's Go Learn, um, was being able to make sure that we can go through this flowchart of MTSS and it's very fluid. Um, wherever the students' needs are, we can fulfill those needs using, um, using their product um, because of its nature of flexibility. And I think you can go to the next slide now, Adam. So, um, you know, those of you that are um, joining us today, I'm not sure how many of you are um, special education directors. Um, in year one, that was my first year um, as a special education director in this district. Not my first year in special ed, but my first year as the director. And um, as you can imagine, it, I was I was nervous and excited at the same time. It was the fall. I'm going to kind of do a little story and journey us all back. It was the fall of 2019. <laughs> Had no idea what was yet to come. And uh, we it was a shotgun start. Um, thankfully, the customer service team customer support team um, at LGL was phenomenal because they paired in with us. And one of the things I knew I needed to do was to have a point person on our team, on my leadership team, to be able to 
really um, intentionally methodically designed an implementation plan because I honestly was not sure how we were going to do it because we wanted to start it the first couple weeks of school. So Pam um, Fesco, who's joining me here, she would, was going to have her own screen, but we're having a little technical difficulties and special ed, you know, we just can be super Roll flexible. We're just rolling with it. So Pam um, jumped right in and um, really started to design that plan with one of our specialists at LGL named Onoa, who's just mm -hmm. been phenomenal. And the year one design, we thought, how can we let this be easy, but intentional? Um, and so we really started off with assessment schedules, PD and usage expectations that was communicated out. And we did a, a training at the very beginning of the year with all staff, and then we dosed them throughout the year mm -hmm. with what we needed to do, not knowing that uh, third quarter was gonna be the beginning of COVID. Um, and we had to shift um, as everyone else did in the country. And uh, one of the things we realized quickly was that um, this was a tool that could be accessed at home. And so we pivoted um, that year and tried to just get through that year one. And then year two, we added extra pieces to that, which you can see here, we, we decided we needed to do office hours, which was an intervention we use with our staff during uh, the shutdown. So we continue to roll with office hours. And then we add in informative assessments that can help us write more robust pros present levels using the diagnostic data um, from the SPED reports that generate right from the usage that LGL, um, our students using LGL are doing. And then year three is this year. And uh, we, we grounded ourselves a little bit this year, um, added a few more things. So as you see the design here, know that all of year one plus all of year two and all of year three are all of the things that we're doing right now um, thanks to Pam and the customer support at LGL. It's just been, I know we keep saying flexible, um, it's, it's been flexible but it's also been um, very practical uh, data and information that we can use. Okay and I think we can go to the next one Adam. So this one is kind of a rehash of what we just talked about, but the first year, given that our district is quite large and we have 11 schools with um, teachers at each site implementing the program, we wanted to keep the implementation of LGL um, as simple and as, um, as easy as we could. So the first year was just about, let's get us in there, let's learn how to cue the assessments in LGL and how to get the kids uh, students enrolled in the EDGE programming, which is the actual prescriptive lessons that they are in. Next slide. And then as we started learning from this, and as Adam was talking about earlier, we, were re we reviewed and revised as we went along. And we noticed that in year two, we had lots of teachers who had previously already learned the system. They didn't need a full training. So um, LGL had developed an on-demand training series so we were able to tell the returning teachers do a refresher on your on the on demand online and we had uh, also separate training set up uh, live for for teachers to be able to come in and learn how to get started how to do some of the things we had done in year one and then we also added in the formative um, assessment features of LGL like the skills and the subtests. We then we, we added in how to use the SPED reports. That's what they're called in LGL, the SPED reports, one of the summaries that you can get of all of the assessments. And then we also wanted to encourage more fidelity of usage. So we trained the administrators how to read the reports and how to know when the product was being used in the classroom. And throughout all of this, we incorporated open office hours. So uh, one of the one of the things we determined was when we provide the training up front, sometimes after somebody gets in and starts using it, that's when they start having the questions. So we would often set up open open office hours the next day where people could log in and ask questions from uh, with the LGL team about what it is that they were trying to do. So it worked out really nicely. Um, people have really been using this product and uh, and loving it actually. Next slide. So these are some of the reports that we focused on, and I did work with Onawa at LGL in developing this. So um, we wanted to set up an intentional assessment schedule throughout the year so that we were each year looking at the same thing so that we could measure growth. So at the beginning of each year, we run the average scores and an average skill gaps reports for those students that may have done the 
the previous assessment at the end of the previous year that we do in our first quarter and then we use the edge prescriptive instruction mid-year we do another diagnostic assessment where we can then run the uh, reports that you see in the middle of the screen which show things like the performance bands how students are performing what the average scores look like we also can run a report on demonstrated gains so we can see where it is that students are making progress and then also what the skills gap look like that help us drive instruction and then at the end of the year we can look at pre post gains so we can actually see where a student started the year and where they ended the year and then we can run all of those mid-year reports as well next slide so some of the reports that we find, this is actually one of the teacher reports, and I was in an IEP meeting this morning actually where a teacher pulled this up during the meeting and ran a diagnostic report for how the student was doing. Now this student has four different diagnostics run on DORA, which is the reading assessment. Um, this is a student in a sixth grade specialty classroom, and I, I noted that on here because our specialty classrooms, um, which would be the best way to describe is maybe students that are um, in a level C type of an environment or where they don't have quite as much exposure to the gen ed classroom, um, but they, they have the, uh, the time to use the tool and they really like it. Lots of growth. We've seen lots of growth for students in this area. This one is actually DORA, so it's measuring all of the sub, the sub tests of reading. And then next slide is um, a, a sixth grade learning lab classroom. So these are students that are um, most likely like a level of service A or in gen a general education classroom most of the day they come in for resource support um, and they also are able to access the the curriculum when they come into the classroom um, and I do have a slide in here later with one of the teachers who does use it um, where she talks about how she incorporates that into her classroom but this one incorporates all of the different strands of math so there's geometry and measurement and nu uh, numerals and, and such here and you can see the growth. Next slide, please. Okay, so this, this is a, a report that shows the, um, the how students are moving through proficiency levels. So um, it's kind of hard to, if, you, if you're not sure what you're looking at here, but it, let's just look at the first two, WS and WS2. If you notice the top, the, the green bar at the top shows 17, and then the next one says 26.8. Five, I think. So what that's saying is that those students in the above area of proficiency actually grew from the first test to this to the pre test or the post test. So as you go across the screen, you can see how they did on high frequency words, uh, word recognition, phonics, vocabulary, spelling, and comprehension. So we can see where the students are becoming more proficient in these strands as they're reading, and we can actually see the growth and how they're changing across the board. Take this information here, which is like an RTI report that's in um, Let's Go Learn, and she can drill down into this and see what students need. So as she has the students on Let's Go Learn doing assessments or their prescriptive lessons, she can then go into this report, and you can't see it on this particular graph, but um, she, you can click into these bars, so she can click into the red bar or that orange bar or blue bar, whatever, and she can see who the students are in each one of those, so she knows how to set up her instructional groupings. So she could say group one is my decoding group, and I'm going to pull these, these children into that group to do decoding and so on. It's really powerful to have all of that information right at your fingertips from the assessments. Um, and that's kind of what she talked about in there, how she likes to use these tools. Um, as a way to guide her instruction. Next slide. So here are some of the um, ongoing opportunities that we have found as we go through Let's Go Learn. Um, achieve, achieving our usage levels. So we originally set up where we wanted them using it at least a half hour a week um, and trying to push that into their, to their weekly daily schedules. Um, and then we increase that to one hour. That becomes a little bit more challenging when you have a highly inclusive environment. So students are in general education classrooms most of the day. It becomes difficult to uh, integrate a pro. Or, uh, we were having trouble anyway integrating it into our programming when students were in a general education classroom. So um, we've had to kind of work around those types of things. Um, we also noticed that 
when um, students or teachers were providing time for Let's Go Learn, they'd say, you know, start now and 20 minutes later, they'd say, okay, guys, you, you know, you're done with your Let's Go Learn time or whatever, and the students would close their laptops. Well, that doesn't efficiently exit the program. So we had to do some training on how to exit the program appropriately so that the usage was showing up in the, um, in the reports. Um, and then we also just wanted to stay on top of the fidelity of usage and make sure that we set up the subscriptions that are available in Let's Go Learn so that uh, both the, the teachers and the school staff at each site could see how, it was be how often it was being used and then help problem solve what, different ways that we could make sure that it was increased. Um, one of the things we really liked about the program is that we had a lot of subjective types of wording in our IEPs and there is a reporting function in IEP Pro or sorry, uh, in Let's Go Learn <laughs> brain um, that actually will ha it has a sped report. So you can go into it and, and copy some of those, um, some of the verbiage in there and paste it directly into your PLAF and then reword it as you need to. So that that turned out to be um, an area that, that was a strength for us that we were able to, to make a fix with some of our existing processes. Now that language is individualized mm -hmm. by the student because of the diagnostic nature of LGL. Yeah, it's it's a pretty it's a pretty cool thing. Um, also, one of the things we learned was the first year when we um, implemented the program, um, we were adding students almost on a daily basis. This is a a suburb of the Phoenix area that is uh, very popular to live in at this time. It's uh, more affordable housing and such. So we had a lot of a lot of mobile um, a lot of mobility issues, and we were having to create new accounts for students, you know, 10, 15 a day. So we were able to integrate it with our SIS, which turned out to be really nice hooking it up with our rosters and it automatically populates the student classes. So teachers, you know, the student enrolls yesterday, the next day they're in, they can queue them for assessments and get them moving. So that was a fantastic opportunity for us. Um, probably the biggest one, at least from my perspective as a person that was trying to um, implement this was staying a step ahead. I didn't know the program either. So we're trying to learn what, what was coming and what we wanted to do next. Um, and working very closely with Onawa, I can't say enough good things about Onawa and how much she helped guide us in this implementation. Um, just staying a, hep, a step ahead and working on that PD plan and what we needed and how to set up the office hours and really intentionally implementing what we wanted everybody on the staff to do and at what time we wanted them to do it so that they didn't feel completely overwhelmed with a new product that they didn't know how to use and you know what what things do I do first and so on. So just staying a step ahead and really making that happen was a big um, benefit and an opportunity for us to um, improve our implementation. Next slide. Oh, that was the <laughs> last one, thank you. All right, I think we'll go ahead and jump into the Q&A portion. Um, if you guys are okay with that, if there's anything else you wanna add. Okay, super. So I'll tell you what, uh, Adam, you can stop sharing your screen. And then I think, um, and Phyllis, if you can turn on your camera too, I see some questions popping up and I see one already for Phyllis too. Um, okay. All right, so first question here is, how did, you know, right now teachers are under a lot of pressure. How did you roll out to the teachers and get them to buy in? Well, I, I would say, um, and I talked about this a little bit already, it was it was the dosing part of it to really take that approach because you're absolutely right. Under in 2019, when we rolled it out, we didn't have the pandemic that we that was coming. And so, but we knew that to um, start them at the beginning of the year with um, something brand new, they had no idea that that was coming. Um, so we, we started with a um, department-wide training. Mm -hmm. So we were all together, allowing them to sit in their teams and ask questions, let them digest it and sit with it. And then we started with a very um, intentional, slow rollout and with the usage being lower than we wanted, but we started with the usage requirement to be on the on the lowest part possible. And then we just built up from there. I think that really helped. And then letting them know that, you know, it's okay that they don't know it. Um, we're gonna work alongside them because it was new to us too. Mm -hmm. So partnering, work. partnering with you guys with LGL and then the customer service was key. One thing I did notice is I love your framework, right? Because so often I see districts roll out initiatives, but their initiative is the end goal and they don't actually have a plan to operationalize. So let me ask you this. Did you share your framework with the teachers? I, my assumption is you they were a part of that too and seeing all that or yes or no? 
I would say no. Uh, um, to be no. honest with you, no. <laughs> not, not, we didn't share the necessary necessarily the framework, but mm -hmm. the the language you know, that, that we were were going to roll this out in phases and not to uh, overreact to what they thought they didn't know. Um, all you have to know right now is how to get students in your class. That's it. This week, that's it. Next week, we're going to talk about queuing and so on. So really intentionally breaking it up into small chunks. Um, so they could probably deduce what we were doing, but we didn't come right out and tell them that. I think, uh, you know, Richard, you make a really good point. I think when teachers have a clear picture and, you know, we're dealing with so many different personalities uh, with our teachers that sometimes there is a need to know, you know, the big picture framework as well as, you know, as uh, uh, Pam just said, you're putting it out in doses. And so this week you do this, next week you do that. I think that's so important for teachers to be able to plan uh, and know what's what's coming their way. So I think that's important. It's a good question, Richard. Very good. Right. Here's a question for Phyllis. Um, it says, nationally, Phyllis, do you see other uh, SPED departments embracing new technology platforms or is Florence an outlier? Um, well, Florence is an outlier because they have taken a lead in doing it. Uh, I do believe we've done some uh, just brief polling a couple places of teachers that are still doing paper, pencil kind of data collection and they don't have the tools to do this kind of assessment that helps them determine current levels of students. So. Um, I think it is something that is happening throughout the nation from what um, what I hear and my connections with all the different directors. I think we are still lagging a bit behind in many school districts, uh, but I think it is, it's critical that we take a look at this. We now all have technology at our fingertips. Uh, I, I believe uh, every student almost uh, and, and every teacher in every school district as a result of the pandemic and so we need to take advantage of that this only makes us better to be able to assess those students in a formative way and not high stakes testing once a year and ongoing so that we can really progress monitor them so um i think i answered that question with a little bit more uh do it all right here's another question um this is for the florence team do you feel like the quality of your ieps have gone up since using the mm -hmm. Let's Go Learn assessment system, even for experienced teachers who may already understand the system or understand how to write IEPs? Absolutely. Um, I think what one of the things that um, in IEP writing that's always a challenge is what should I say? What should I not say? You know, what are the rules in this state or that state where, you know, we all have different compliance rules that we have to, to adhere to. But one of the things that I think is universal across the nation is reporting the data, right? Um, what is the what is, what reading level are you at? What instructional level are you at? That's something that is not subjective. Um, that is just those are just the data. And so I think that framework has really helped with our staff mm -hmm. to be able to have that. And it's given them that confidence to be able to report that out um, because they have. They have all of the progress monitoring and the um, usage reports, fidelity reports, all of that, um, the growth reports at their fingertips. Great, thank you. And here's another question. I can answer this one real quickly. Um, does Let's Go Learn work with pre-K? And I would say in the pre-K area, we're gonna be a little lighter because we are dealing with academic topics of reading and mathematics. I mean, we will go into beginning sounds, letter recognition, uh, number recognition. But so if those are your pre-K, then we cover some of those, but it's going to be lighter. Otherwise, where we get more diagnostic is once you start jumping into, you know, learning to read and learning to do math. Um, okay, so let me see here. Do we have any more questions? Uh, Can I interject just a little yeah, bit, Richard? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm not, not sure if all of our listeners are aware of a recent finding that just came out from the Office of Civil Rights about the Los Angeles Unified School District, where they were cited uh, to have to provide compensatory services. They're the second largest school district in the nation. And I think we're seeing that with this particular school district, they had some difficulties during the pandemic and offering services. 
and the settlement agreement where they were found out of compliance or are not meeting their obligations to students with disabilities is pretty remarkable. It's pretty um, complex what this school district is going to have to be doing. Um, and I don't think any of us, uh, I think many of us do see this as where things may be going from the Office of Civil Rights. Most recently, we've also seen that they have come out with, they are looking to strengthen and change the requirements of Section 504. There is going to be an opportunity for us to comment and respond. I tell you that coupled with what happened in LA Unified, with what's coming out of the Office of Civil Rights, it is more and more imperative that we have systems in place to understand exactly where our students are functioning and we can document that we know um, where their reading level is, where their math level is, how they're achieving on their goals and objectives. And one of the systems uh, that Let's Go Learn has to offer is an option for, for looking at that for school districts. I think we're going to be held more accountable than ever because of what's happening with equity and access through the Office of Civil Rights and their lens of what they're looking for in school districts. I also think that um, we're going to see them more and more in our schools looking to make us accountable. So I don't think that um, I don't think that we should, as we come out of the pandemic, go back to the way we used to be doing things. There's a lot of money that's flowing to school districts, special ed and general ed. So some of my comments are not just reserved for special education regarding uh, the accountability of student performance and student outcomes. So I, I think we all owe it to ourselves and our school districts and our communities, our parents, our families, to really engage in looking at where our students are performing, how we can document that, how we can show that, and how we can show that to parents and students themselves, especially as our students are getting older. I'll stop there. I can get on that soapbox and keep going for, for a while, but I can't stress how important resources like this are for, for our listeners to pay attention to and engage with. All right, great. Well, thank you so much. Um, I think the rest of the questions is a few very technical things that we don't need to share with everyone else. We'll answer those individually. Um, I wanted to thank you all for this wonderful uh, opportunity to see how you guys operationalized your change. And we're really, really excited to be sharing this with everyone. Um, everyone will receive an email with a recording link. We will also um, be having a demo next week where people, if they want to be able to watch um, our system and find out a little bit more about it. Um, so thank you everyone very much. And is there anything else you'd like to add as last words, uh, Florence? I know uh, Phyllis just went as well. well thank you to Chase and LGL for inviting us to do this. It, it gave us an opportunity to really reflect on our work. Sometimes we don't do that enough. And uh, we realized, I at least uh, um, in my role realized um, the progress that we've made because sometimes it doesn't feel like we do mm -hmm. and so that reflection piece of really it, this really made us sit down and take a look at everything and we've not done that um, you know this year yet so this was this was this was a great practice for us thank you Richard thank you Case right. yes, yes absolutely you, I Lawrence. appreciate the opportunity and a mantra that we have adhered uh, we've taken it from Ricky Robertson's pro progress not perfection and that's always what you got to keep in mind um, we're always looking to improve and, and better address the needs of our students. And we just appreciate the support from both Case and Let's Go Learn in our efforts to do that. And I'm you know, very thankful. Thank you. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, everyone. Have a good rest Bye. of your day.